The Church Turing, Turing thesis is a very interesting one. So Alan Turing was studying the Turing machines that in that time were not called Turing machines. <laughs> um, was studying Turing machines to understand the um, foundations of mathematics. So at that time, mathematicians were really trying to understand if the mathematical foundations that we that they had at the time even made sense. So if the logic that they had made sense and, and they had some numerical problems as well that they were trying to tackle. So the idea was for Turing was, can I create a formalism that is able to represent mechanical steps that possibly a human could take? So the original intent was really the idea to capture all feasible processes that a human could take in a, a fixed amount of time. So eventually they would be able to do it um, to carry out, to compute something, a number. So uh, following just a very simple, um, obvious steps. At that time, there were no computers, right? But this is basically what a machine could do. So if you have a very stupid machine, you give it a program and it's going to do instruction by instruction. That is basically what a computer is. So Turing machines are trying to capture all general and effective procedures which de determine whether something is the case or not. And this is what is known as a decision procedure. That's what a, a Turing machine captures. So what the, the church Turing thesis is saying is that any possible program that you might write, any possible program, must be, has to have an equivalent Turing machine that represents it. So a problem is computable if and only if there exists a Turing machine that recognizes. What has also been shown is that Turing machines are equivalent to lambda terms. And as you probably know, all, progr all programming languages that you know of are equivalent to lambda terms and therefore equivalent to Turing machines. So although they're very simple, and as you've seen, the only thing they can do is they can read something from a tape, move left or right, write to it. That's enough to be able to describe whatever program you can do. It might just do it very, very slowly. And that is a very powerful abstraction. But one that is very interesting is the following step, which is Turing thought, how could we, if, if according to the church Turing thesis, the idea is that a program could represent, sorry, a, a Turing machine could represent a program, they're equivalent, you could always get one to the other. Okay, so what does the universal Turing machine does? Well, can we go one step further, which is, can we write a program that is able to interpret and execute any other program? So now, because you are probably already even done CS450 or are currently doing 450, you know that we have programs that are able to execute other programs. We usually call them interpreters, right? Or we could even do something a bit different, which is I take a program, I already know how to execute it using my using assembly. So I, what I could do is I could compile a certain program to another programming language. And that programming language, I know how to execute its assembly. I let my comp computer execute it. So we have this notion now but at the time, this notion didn't exist, right? The idea of having a machine that can compute a textual explanation of what a machine should do is actually a very far-fetched and interesting abstract notion. The idea is essentially that, you know, a Turing machine is essentially a computer. Can you write a computer that could essentially emulate any other computer. This would be the universal Turing machine. Or to put it another way, a Turing machine interpreter. 
So the universal Turing machine is one that, that Turing introduced, and he showed how you can write that. And the universal Turing machine is capable of, given a machine, so it's, you can think of it as a function that takes the source code of the machine and the input that you're going to initialize it with, and then it runs, executes that machine. So if the Turing machine M that you received as input accepts the input, then your machine should accept it. If the Turing machine loops, then your machine should loop. And if the machine terminates, your machine should terminate as well. Because it's just an interpreter, right? It's just running a program. And whatever the program wants to do, the interpreter should do. So as long as you understand what an interpreter does, then understanding this should be trivial. But at the time, it was really not trivial. And in fact, this idea inspired um, John von Neumann and the creators of the first computers to, to introduce the notion of a stored procedure, which is essentially saving a program and loading it from memory. And this is great because it means that you don't have to create hardware, print hardware every time. You can just have a machine that represents the universal Turing machine, aka a computer, that will run these things, aka programs, right? You take a program, you take the input, and you run it. That's what all computers now do, but at the time there were no computers. <laughs> so Alan Turing had a very, very important impact in modern computers. And this was the idea that I was talking about, um, the idea of start programs and its influence. And actually, in the beginning of these slides, I, I added a link to um, an encyclopedia, uh, Moderna or something. I forget. Let me. Okay. So if you go to the first slide, if you click on Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, it has a very interesting read on uh, Alan Turing and Turing machines. So I highly recommend you to click and just read. It's a very leisure read. It's nothing, um, it's not formal or anything. It's just history. And it's an interesting story to, to read. Okay, in the next video, we're going to be talking a bit about um, extensions of Turing machines and how powerful are they? How more powerful are they?